Obviously, we are recording this episode uh, here in Australia before our Paralympic athletes head overseas to Tokyo to represent our country. Dylan Alcott, a Paralympian, a gold medalist in two different sports himself. G'day, mate. G'day, mate. And I'm very excited because if you've been watching the Olympic Games like pretty much every single Australian was, you might have seen our next guest on way too many ads during it. Like, I'm telling you, I was, you know, I used to be the guy in ads and then I was like, zero ads for me. And our next guest has just taken over, which I was pretty pumped to see, I must say. Um, so yeah, she's taken the time to come on and chat to us pretty much only a week before we leave. So we're very appreciative. We are. Let's let her introduce herself. I'd like to say first that it was not zero ads for you, Dylan, because I definitely saw your face. Okay, there was one ad. There yeah, was okay. one key yeah. ad. Okay, I'll take it. <laughs> um, but I'm Madison. Um, I've been to, to three games. I'm a wheelchair racer, um, mostly longer distances now. Um, I did get through my first few games as a sprinter and then switched to long stuff, primarily marathons immediately after. So yeah, going into Tokyo's fourth games, it's my first time trying to do like a full program. So three events on the track plus the marathon on the closing ceremony day. So we'll see how that goes. Very crazy. Nice. That is crazy. What's that? What's that? I mean, it's just ridiculous. I mean, because you... I just don't understand as an athlete how you can have such varied range and and skill sets to be able to go from 800 to, to a marathon is ridiculous. So hats off to you. Um, yeah, I feel like the wheelchair racing is kind of similar to swimming in that regard. Once you have the skill set down, it actually translates quite well across many. Having said that, I feel like I grew up in this sport watching so many of my teammates do all those four events. And I was like, yeah, this is what you do. And now that it's my turn to do it, I'm like, is this what we do though? <laughs> have to do this? Hey, what? So, We'll get into how you train for the mall and stuff um, in a minute. But before we do, what what is your disability? You start every one of these with this question. Yeah, we do. Just to get out of the way. And then we can get onto the good stuff. No, this is... Are you serious? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I ask you why? Oh, I like this. So I want to know this because this is a good place to say. Do you identify for disability, like identity first or person first? Have we had this conversation? No, we haven't. That's what I'm asking. Right. So... Definitely person first when it comes to disability as a broad I like it. disability conversation. Yep. If we're becoming more specific, like say someone's a wheelchair user or if we're getting more specific, I think it's fine. I think that person first language is important when we're talking broad. So I think, I think the argument against it that I've heard is that we don't use person first language for nearly any other descriptor. Mm-hmm. So if we're talking about, you know, it's, the blonde woman. We wouldn't say the woman who's blonde. We'd say that. Where I think with that though, it's so specific. We know going in, we're talking about hair color. We're not talking about that person in their entirety. We're talking about one specific feature and there is enough social context already for us to know exactly what that is. Whereas I don't believe we have that with disability and it does two things. One is it paints all disability as the same, which is an incredibly huge problem that I think we're all constantly having to battle as people with disabilities. Second, I think we often get our entire identity wrapped up in disability already. Like that's a big thing that happens the minute you have any kind of disability. The minute anyone knows that, sees that, that becomes your entire identity. So when you say you are a disabled person, it wraps your entire identity up in that one identifier. And I find that a little bit, that's one of the biggest challenges we face. And if we can step away from that, just in the language that we use, that's such a huge first step. There's so many more steps after that. But yes, I do believe in first person language when it comes to the broader term disability. I told you she was good, Gus. Gonna get straight in there. Um, so dropping books, knowledge. Do you, are you? <laughs> it's, I'm gonna ask you, Gus, as an able-bodied person. So are you fully across the idea of um, person first language and as opposed to identity? Uh, it's it's for me. It's a tricky subject. To I've, every time we have an interview, I feel nervous because I want to do the interview justice to everyone listening and to the person who's the guest, of course. But it's also interesting because we've had people who identify with their disability first deliberately. So they want to be known for the disability. And then we have people like yourself, Mads, who are very happy to be, you know, talk about themselves before we get into why you're in a chair, for example. So I, I, the, the, it's a little bit of the eggshell moment for me in interviews because I don't know which way that's going to go. Um, but I also love, hearing stuff like that and i think it's really interesting and informative where did you so feel like start finding your feet to want to talk about stuff like this 
mads in that way you know what i mean like as an not not you know the word advocate is annoying and people might call you and i advocates but we're not going out there to be advocates we're just being ourselves you know what i mean but when did you i guess feel the confidence to speak up and be confident about talking about disability in such a broad i guess great lens when I realized how few voices there were in that conversation. So I definitely avoided it for the longest time. I was almost resentful that every Paralympian that I saw coming through the sport ended up in some kind of advocacy space. Like every conversation trended towards disability, even though that was not how that person wanted to identify necessarily. It became this responsibility that we all had to take on that not a single one of us asked for. And so I think I went through like the first five years of my career just not wanting to do it and shying really hard away from it. But the reality is, is sport creates one of the biggest platforms for people with disabilities. And there's not that many of us in the sport that have big enough platforms have a voice. And we could, both of us could probably name who all of them are. Mm -hmm. And that's unfortunate because it means that an entire community is being represented in the way you speak and your words and people are people without disabilities are creating their entire idea of, of, of how to treat 20% of our community based on our words. And that's a huge responsibility. And I think I, I saw it being done, started to realize that my platform was growing and that I do have a responsibility to do that because my life and my opportunities and the way I'm treated by people around me and how I choose to be treated has been, I've been able to develop that and grow that because of people who like Louise, for example, who, who use her platform to create that space. And I'm a product of that space that she created. And so it kind of becomes our responsibility to continue doing that. Who's Louise? I know who Louise is, but who's Louise? Louise Savage, sorry. Louise Savage. Okay, yeah. now Gus. Nine times yes, gold Louise medal Savage. winning. So she is your coach, mentor still going on? Yeah. I, so Louise, for anyone listening who doesn't know Louise Savage, you're missing out. She's a star. Um, and like she was probably the first... I don't want to speak out of turn here, but I, at least for our age bracket, Mads, we're around the same age. She was the first Paralympian who really cut through in the mainstream after the Sydney Olympics and Paralympics because she competed at both because they had an event, right? I remember seeing on Rove Live. If you're on Rove Live, you've made it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You made it. So how, where did you first connect with her? Um, so same as you in that Lou was the only really person that looked like me that I saw growing up I think we both have a luxury of growing up like after 2000 so we had a Paralympian as a household name growing up which is you know I don't think we realized that that wasn't the case beforehand necessarily so I connected with Lou Lou was coming back to to Perth for a wedding and I had gotten into water racing already in like a you know casual way and basically she was told to come to the track and have a look and see you know I think someone saw potential in me and so she actually came out to the track took time out of her, her trip home to to come and see me push and um she basically encouraged me to come to my first water racing um comp it's here in Sydney and Canberra it's the Summer Under Series which um we do every single year through the summer um, and at first I was incredibly hesitant. I didn't think that sport was necessarily going to be my future at that point. Um, it was just something that I was, I was doing, but Lou is incredibly persuasive. Um, it's very <laughs> hard to say no to Louise Savage. That's correct. To do something. So my mum and I went over and I absolutely fell in love with the sport, um, you know, over the course of a week, basically, and, and not just the sport, but by like these incredible people that I got to be surrounded by in this world that I hadn't even known existed up to that point. So I came home after that. And I think maybe a couple months in, Lou gave me a call and asked if I wanted to start working together. And that's obviously not something that you say no to. So Lou and I have been working together. This is, yeah, our fourth games together. Amazing. So you were a athlete at the Paralympics at the age of 14. What, what would yes. you say as a 27 year old, what would you say going into a fourth games? what would you say to that 14 year old who got to stand on the dais and win a, a medal as well? Would there be any advice you'd go back to say to 14 year old? Oh, Matt? definitely not. Definitely not. <laughs> um, no, I would leave her to all of her devices, all of her mistakes, everything. I, I think that I have two answers to this question. On the one hand, I would like to tell 14 year old me, any young kid that you already have absolutely everything that you need to become the person you're gonna be. It's just a matter of putting all these pieces together and working out where they fit. On the other hand, I think you don't work out where they fit unless you make every mistake that you're gonna to have to make. Well, so fair. realistically, I would just leave her to it. Fair enough. I was actually pretty flat 
that Mads won a, uh, a medal in Beijing Angus because I was 17 and I thought I was going to be the youngest medalist. And then like <laughs> a day later, she's like, I'm 14 and won a medal. <laughs> I was like, that's some proper bullshit. Love this. Like, yeah, so, sorry, proper BS. I can't swear. Angus, get out of that. And how did you end up in the track? Because obviously Dylan, you know, won a, a medal playing basketball and obviously he's now transitioned into tennis. For you, was swimming cycling what 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 was it for you that you ended up on the track and have stayed there I tried a bunch of sports first um uh WA has a massive basketball program so many of our rollers and gliders are based over there so I think that was the one that I knew about the most I am so uncoordinated that it's like bordering on embarrassing I think it's, it's very embarrassing um so I was trying basketball for the third or fourth time and the guy that coaches my name Frank Ponta another absolute friend but legend and he pulled me to the side on like, I want to say my fourth attempt. And I'm paraphrasing here, but basically said, you're not an asset to this team. Do you want to try something else? We have a track chair in the storage room. Do you want to give it a go? And I did. I tried out this track chair in the parking lot of this basketball stadium. It was so big. It was way too big for me. So I had foam either side trying to keep me in the middle of it. Um, But absolutely fell in love with it. Well, i got to ask, because obviously when lockdown happened, I couldn't play the, like, back in 2020, I couldn't play tennis. So I went full track mode and I started pushing on the road in my old basketball chair and doing like sprints around a track. Angus, Angus and I work on radio. He decided to run a marathon after radio one day for no reason, right? Yeah, how far did you get Gus? 28. 28 Ks, no training, right? <laughs> Why would you pick track mats? Cause they, it sucks, <laughs> okay. it's so hard. So here's the thing. I, I, I loved the track. I love that it was, I love that it was independent. I love that everything that you put in, you got back out right away. I love that. I can see, you know, my speeds, my heart rate, all my numbers right there in front of me. It's very um, tangible, I guess. Like it's all right there and you can see your progression. When I discovered that I was inclined towards longer distances, there was a moment there where I was like, what am I doing? Yeah. It's an entirely different world. So I, I sprinted in Beijing and London and the last time I raced 100, 200 was the finals in, in 2012. And I raced my first marathon like the middle of the next year. And I think all that happened very quickly. I didn't really take time to think about it. And I think it was when I was in London getting ready for my first marathon, I was like, how did this happen? <laughs> How do I find out this was my skill set? And so, yeah, that was definitely the progression there. But I, I do love the training and I, I, I love the marathon for entirely different reasons. But yeah, it is different. And speaking of the lockdown, obviously a lot has changed. Like Dylan said, he wasn't allowed to go and play tennis. So he had to kind of, you know, find a new way to keep fit. Um, you know, doing my research on you, Mads, I've seen a lot of your patio, which is behind you on the Zoom. Um, <laughs> uh, how did you stay motivated um, you know, keeping the wheels literally turning over and because it, it's so tough. We're in a six lockdown here as we record this in Melbourne and the first day I did exercise, second day I didn't and here we are like day three and four and I've done nothing. It's hard to keep motivated. It is. I, it was, it was really strange. I think it was confronting for a lot of us. It was definitely was for me because I think I've always, you know, prided myself on being someone who, you know, can motivate herself like intrinsically get the job done and then I realized without having to meet someone for training being held accountable for my times I'm not actually that person <laughs> I will I will train every day but I won't do the time that I'm meant to my whole day I feel like nothing done I will procrastinate my one training session for like six hours if you let me um so that was a confronting realization so I think it was just creating like basically just new methods like new ways to to work at what you needed and I think it also created this um like I guess problem solving approach to stuff. And I think we can carry so much of that forward. Like I definitely learned a lot about myself during that without having, without being able to rely on the performance team that I usually have around me, which is significant. So I think that, yeah, it was definitely tricky, but also you don't really have a choice, right? Like this is, at the end of the day, it, it's just our job, like as much as, as anything else. So you kind of get it done. I just definitely didn't do it probably in the way that I was meant to for that first month of lockdown. A question for you both as, you know, athletes heading into this Paralympics. Dylan, I was with you when we found out the Olympics was cancelled because of COVID. We were on air that day when the official statement came through from the IOC. Um, do you, do you how remember you, who said how it? Do you, remember, you both... do you remember who said it? Oh, yes. Dick something. Dick Pound. Big Dick Pound. Dropping news. <laughs> <laughs> we made so many jokes on there about Dick Pound. 
That was the one shining light. That was the one shining light of horrible um, news, exactly. So how, for you both, because you work, you know, in these four-year blocks of, you know, with the date set, with that uncertainty of the games even going ahead, did you stay training the whole way through, uh, both of you, like going into it, or did you just put the, the tennis racket and the chair down for a bit and go, well, if, if, if I'm not going to train with no date inside or certainty around it? I, my team offered me um, time off, basically asked if I wanted to, now would be the time to take it, um, that there wouldn't be an opportunity for this kind of time off after this year at all. Like this was not something that was going to come around again. Um, and I said no to it. I think the idea of not having that structure, not having that purpose was really confronting I definitely didn't train with the intensity that I always do. I definitely gave myself like a little more leeway in what I was doing, um, which was nice. It was nice to just feel like I was training to stay fit and healthy without that pressure that 2020 started with. Um, so it was, it was a different kind of, of training. Um, and I was definitely given a little bit more, I guess, movement in that space. It wasn't as regimented as it always is, but I, yeah, I, um, I don't think I would have wanted to be in my head if I wasn't also training every day. Yeah, I trained throughout. I tell you what I did poorly was I didn't admit that I was struggling. Like I acted cool. Like, you know, I was like, I'll be right. Like whatever. We can't control it. I'll be fine. And I was like, it actually was devastating news. And that's okay to say I'm devastated. Right. But I was probably trying to be too much of a bit of a stoic legend. And it reflected on my the way that I, you know, was acting around my friends and family. And, and then I realized, and I was like, I think it's okay to say, look, obviously I'm not lining up at Centrelink, which is way worse, but it's still upsetting that my life goal might now be over. And, you know, I probably, this potentially could be my last Paralympics. If this wasn't on, I don't have an end, you know, a swan song to go. So I think physically I was there, but mentally I probably was struggling a bit. And um, it's been a nice refresher actually this year and watching the Olympics as well has been pretty cool because I've got the juice now. Like I've really got the juice and really excited to, to get over there and, and seeing all the athletes compete. And um, have you felt the same? Oh my God, absolutely. I, yeah, I think it was mentally incredibly challenging. I think our whole lives exist in these four year cycles and to have that structure taken away, all those, I think you base your life and the goals that you set and to suddenly have none of that, I think really through. I think I did what you did. I was like, this is totally fine when it was yeah. a not fine. Um, but yeah, I think watching the Olympics go ahead kind of made it really real like I think so many of us up until the Olympics started were like it could still get cancelled right like I think things have changed so last minute so many times it, it's so hard to really know and I didn't I don't think I wanted to let myself believe it was going to go ahead until it was going ahead so I think to to see that and to see like the enormous success of it how much buy-in there was back home but in Japan as well and those experiences from the athletes as well to kind of see all of that I think is really kind of yeah I, I'm looking forward to, to the 24th and you're good thing about marathon is you're going to have fans did you see the marathon it was packed it's awesome oh i'm jealous the japanese aren't allowed to be there's no spectators in tokyo at the moment but yeah in particular the triathlon and marathon because it's outside and it's such a long course yeah there was you you're able to have you'd be cheered on it's pretty impressive i haven't awesome. even thought about that at all leading in and i saw that i was like this is actually kind of nice like yeah. i'm glad that i get to do that mm. now i want to ask about the training because when i play tennis i hit I play tennis. It's tennis. You hit forehands, backhands, you hit serves. I go to the gym and I, I do like fitness and stuff, but how do you break like 800 meters to a marathon is obviously a very long difference, a big difference. How do you break up what you're doing? Like, do, do you go one day 800s the next day marathons or what's the split? Every session kind of has an event in mind while we're doing it. But again, it does all complement each other. So I, for example, approach an 800 with knowing I have that uh, enormous fitness space behind it. It's where race in 800 is dictated by that skill set. So a lot of the girls racing eight are actually coming up from the sprints. I think there's only one or two of us that are actually coming down from the longer distances for the 800. Um, so the way I would race it would actually look quite different to how someone coming up to sprint would. So it's quite an interesting event to watch when you know everyone's skill sets and their approach and what they're waiting for and, and how they plan on executing their race. So I definitely um, have a similar structure to, to the events that I do. Um, and I think if, 
for whatever reason, the training stopped complementing the shorter stuff. So A, I would give it up before I changed my training. So it's more right now, it allows me to do all of it. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I watched the um, Peter Bowl run the 800. Shout out to Peter Bowl, if mm. he's listening. There is some serious argy-bargy going on, like elbows and like fighting for position. Uh, is the wheelchair track the same vibe? Like, is oh, there crashes? It's so messy. It's so messy. And when it goes bad, it goes really bad. I've been lucky. I have not been involved in a crash in a race. I've been in races where crashes have happened, but I've managed to not be anywhere near them. But I remember my first Paralympics, our first Paralympics in Beijing, I think the 5,000 had an enormous crash in the women's wheelchair race. And I think that was my first like introduction to what wheelchair racing was. And that has like stayed with me for mm. years. So yes, there definitely is. I think the women probably race a little nicer and leave a little more space than the men do. There's definitely far more crashes on the men's side. <laughs> but yes, it is pushy. I actually watched your 5,000 meter victory in London at the Para World Championships a couple of years ago. And there seemed to be uh, quite a lot of camaraderie between you and the other athletes as well like I, I watched as you were kind of doing you know a, a forced victory lap by just slowing down that you know you had everyone else coming <laughs> over to you and like shaking your hands and and you know saying congratulations the american team there's there's definitely a lot of respect in what we do i think that when you're lining up at a paralympic games at a world championships you know that every single one of those women has done the exact same work that you've done and so it's hard to not respect everyone that's lining up there beside you and any one of those races on any day, it could be any one of ours. And so it that makes, I think, so easy to respect every athlete around you. And you kind of, you do share that. I think when you're on the track, when you're actually moving, yes, it's competitive, it's messy. You don't have like the fondest emotions for the people mm. like beside you. But the minute it's done, it's done. And, and these are the women that, you know, I see nearly every month on the marathon circuit. And when we're all chasing qualifies throughout the year, you do help everyone to try and to try and do that together and then just kind of let it go at the end of the race. And, you know, you, you do work together. And so I think it's hard to just switch that off at a game. So yeah, there definitely is. There's a huge amount of sport, I think, in our sport, in our sport. I feel like I've heard that answer before on, on the ad on TV, <laughs> every, every line. <laughs> hey, <laughs> shout out to Optus. Um, <laughs> hey, what about the, like, what was that feeling for you? We're doing like a couple of Paralympic specials, right? So um What's that feeling like when you get to the Paralympic Village? Because for me, I've never really seen, like, you know people with disability, but you don't see disability in that sense. You know what I mean? So what was that feeling for you the first time you rolled in there? Good question. I don't think I've ever been asked that. Um, I think it's, I think at first you're kind of viewing it as looking at it and, and it feels unfamiliar because you've never seen you've never been in a space with, with that many people with disabilities before. Like, you know, you're kind of going from what we were seeing, you know, back home. And then I think to, I think the, the part that got me more was how little interest everyone had in mind. And that was, you know, one of the first times I had seen that. And I think it's a shock when you first do enter the village and you see the many people with disabilities, but then it's, also interesting to note how quickly that shock wears off and how little interest you then have in it. And I think that that's basically what you want, right? That's what you want in, in, in all communities everywhere is how little interest we have in everyone else's disability to kind of become the norm. You want the 80% to adopt that kind of thinking that we have. And, and the Paralympic Village is a really deep end way to kind of have that experience. But I think that initial, um, not being that lack of familiarity with it lasts maybe 48 hours at a stretch. And that's what you want. That's such a good answer. And it got me thinking because like when I was, when we're getting you on the podcast, like we've known each other since we were 17 and 14. I have no idea what your disability is. I have no <laughs> idea. Did you know that? Right. <laughs> I, I've got a piece of paper here that's telling me and I'm going, Oh, it's the same as my doubles partner. Heath. I had no idea. Because <laughs> Because we don't care. Like, and you, you know, I have, I play a tennis match against someone and someone goes, oh, what's their disability? And I go, I, go, I don't know. Like, no, I, don't, I don't know. And when you said it like that, it's so true because you're in awe of seeing so many incredible people with disability doing amazing things when you get there. But then you're just like, actually, what sport do they do? Or how do they compete? Or what are they elite at? Or whatever it is. And 
when you break it down like that, it made me think, yeah, I didn't even know why you are in a wheelchair the same way that you probably don't even know why I'm in a wheelchair, you know, unless, yeah. you, unless someone asks us on sunrise or whatever, because we have to tell them, you know? Yeah, it's only when it's like live and you don't know how to like politely like shy away from that question. But I, yeah. I wouldn't know half my teammates. I wouldn't know. I don't think I've ever asked unless someone has like an incredibly interesting story. And then it's like, you can't make yes. But that's it. That's, that's about where it ends. Yeah. One of my, one yeah. of my opponents said he got was train surfing and fell off a train and got his legs run over. And then I read a newspaper article and it was not true. Stop <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We will have yeah. on the uh, we will have on the show next year a guy who lost his leg to a great white shark, and that is a story that I need to know every single detail of. So yeah, that's that's, cool. that's, that's, that's cool. a story we need to hear. That's cool. I like that. Um, a question for you both: um, watching the Olympics, and in particular for me personally, watching Patty Mills and the Boomers, you could see how much wearing the green and gold meant to him personally and the team. Can you identify the difference you feel for representing your country? and people with disability? What a question. God, we're on fire today. Fair. Yeah. Um, it's definitely different racing wearing the green and gold than it is racing at any other time, competing at any other time. I think you're, I think you're, you're so aware of how much is behind that and how much history is in that as well. And you can't not recognise that you're where you are because of a whole family of people that that came before us and, and you can't get away from that when you're in uniform we don't want to get away from it you know that you know there is there's just so much to it and it kind of it's it's a privilege and it's a responsibility to wear it and that becomes the best possible feeling i think in terms of representing disability that's an, an enormous responsibility and I, and I think one of the things i love so much about our Paralympic family is how seriously I think every single one of us takes that. I think we we're aware of what that world can look like and the direction we want it to go. And I think we all have such different experiences in our in our personal lives and our childhoods and in all of that. And where you know there's so much overlap, but so many different stories as well. And I think that what that results in is every single one of us knowing how that could potentially look and trying to do our part for it. And that's, I think, one of the things that I, I really do love so much and why it's such a privilege to be a part of our Paralympic team, our Paralympic family, because you're surrounded by, by this incredible group of people who, who are trying to do more than just sport. I think sport is so important. The impact that it has is, is enormous, but it has such an enormous impact on communities because people relate to it so much. I think whether you're an athlete, an admin, just a spectator, you, you buy into sport. I think particularly in Australia, it's such a huge part of our culture. And so communities are impacted when we see live sport happening. And I think that, you know, people with disabilities, there are so many of us and we're so incredibly underrepresented. And every single one of us out there in Tokyo wearing the green and gold, recognizes that and knows the impact that we are having back home and it was one of my biggest concerns when the postponement was uh, maybe a cancellation and obviously I was selfishly incredibly stressed about that like I wanted to be in Tokyo and, and racing and that was obviously a huge priority for me but we don't see people with disabilities on our screen and if we didn't have the Paralympics go ahead it'd be eight years before we saw disability sport again and we know the impact sport has on communities and we're just excluding 20 percent of our communities by not having the Paralympics that's an incredible loss to not just the 20 percent but the 80 percent of our community that don't get to experience the entire potential of the other 20 percent so I think all of us do carry that responsibility with us when we're the green and gold on the Paralympic team and I love how seriously i think we all try and, and do that and the authenticity that every athlete really does bring to that yeah well said and i think also it's like you know it's our holy grail so basketballs at the olympics might have the nba or whatever it is and look you and i are a bit different and i know that like i've got grand slams and you've got world athletic championships that gets coverage so but for a lot of Paralympic athletes this is it you know what i mean so that's why we all get up for it to represent ourselves and how much we appreciate the opportunity I think the social, the, the Paralympics is a beacon for generational social change as well. 
it is actually breaking down barriers for people that might not know anybody with a disability to put on the TV and be like, oh my God, look at these people with a disability achieving with purpose, doing things that they probably didn't think that was possible for them to do. I will also like to give a shout out to people with a disability who aren't athletes as well, who might hate the Paralympics <laughs> because when they go down we the street- We have a bowl of uncomfortable question coming up based- I'll save it. That. I'll save it. All right. You're a smart man, I guess. Yeah. yeah I'm serious. Okay. Because, because, you know, they're all like, oh, well, if you're not a Paralympian, no one cares about it. So we'll wait. I'll, I don't want to go too early on that. I'll wait for that. Um, but I think yeah. the opportunity to, I guess, impact that social change is probably even more important than the sport itself. And the example I'll give is this. We were too young to probably to fully understand this, Mads, but we went to Beijing where if you had a disability, you were ostracized, locked up inside. Like if you were from China with a disability there, you know, it was really tough. And they had the Paralympic games and they were a bit like, oh, we would just like to have the Olympics, who cares about the Paralympics? But they had a, made a real effort. And that actually changed, I heard, the culture for how people with a disability then integrated into community. London Paralympics was a juggernaut. It changed the way people from the UK integrated into the community. They got jobs, you know, not as much as they could have, but they got job opportunities. All people with disabilities, they went on dates, they started traveling, they started doing the things they might not have done before. So it's a powerful medium for that. And I think, I don't feel the, we don't feel the pressure of that, but I think we feel the responsibility in a good way. Is that how you feel as well? Absolutely. I think sport has this ability to change the way we view someone's identity. I think if you saw a person with a disability, you were drawn to see the disability. When you see athletes, which we're so familiar with and can empathize with as athletes, it, it's hard to just see disability at that point. You have to see sport. You have to see the athleticism. You have to see all of like the entire spectrum of emotion that you watch someone go through at a Paralympic games and, and you can't get away from that. And it, forces us to see people with disabilities as entire people. And I know that that bar is on the floor, what I just said, yeah. pointing that that is where it is, but, but it does. And it forces you to see the, the humanity, I, I think, in people. And we do carry that with us forward. We're not going to just apply that to athletes. It's easy for us to do for athletes because sport is such a, a huge identity. You can't escape that when, when we see it. But we're going to keep applying that moving forward and, and sport has a space to start creating the space for us to then carry that forward through our community. You're, you're like a powerful, proud woman of your career, but also the person that you are, which I love. We when we always like this or did you struggle? Oh, I struggled so much. Can you, so tell, us, can you, tell, us, can you tell us a bit about that? I think that I, I struggled with working out who I was so much. I think as, as a person with a disability, as a girl, that's also incredibly challenging. They're both identities that are definitely forced upon us. And you're told very much where you're going to go, how you're going to be, how you have to look. And I think, you know, if we talk about the body image issue, for example, like every person struggles with this, every girl struggles with it, arguably a little more. You throw in disability with that and it's a losing battle. It's, it's impossible to make peace with that. I think that growing up as a girl with a disability, I there, there was absolutely no way that I was, no matter how much work I put in, what I changed, I was never gonna be able to be what I thought I had to be in order to be society's idea of what I should be. And so I think when you're at a point where it's that impossible, you're forced to really take a good hard look at it. And I was able to do this through sport. Sport definitely helped me, I think. As an athlete, you have to have this love and respect for your body or else you're going to ask it to do the most ridiculous things and back it up again the next day and hurt and then deliver the results. And if you were going to demand that from your body, you have to have that love and respect for it. That doesn't work if you're someone who is in a body that society is telling you to hate and you're buying into that narrative. So it wasn't this logical. It wasn't this black and white thoughts, but I, I did know that if I wanted to go anywhere in this sport, I was going to have to really address that part of me that resented the body that I was in. So I definitely had to do a lot of really active work to move away from that. And I don't think 
it needs to be that extreme for us to start having that conversation with ourselves. I think we have to have that love and respect for who we are. And, and as an athlete, you're constantly trying to improve your physical self, your body. So you want it to be better and to improve, but you can't resent it in the space that it is now. And we're always two seconds away from injury. And you're going to go backwards when that happens. And you can't resent your body from that space either. You have to respect that it's able to, in that injured space, you know that it's able to recover and move forward because it's done it a million times for us. So you have to have that really positive relationship with yourself. And that is in enormous contrast to how we tell people with disabilities to exist in their bodies. So I had the privilege of doing that through sport. We don't all have that. And this is a challenge for every single person coming to terms with who you are. People with disabilities, it is infinitely harder. And if I could do one thing with my sporting platform, and I would love to see this happen, you know, before my career is out, whether that's going to happen, doubtful, is kids with disabilities not having to grow up justifying the space that they take up which is definitely what I did and I'm imagining it's definitely what you did your entire identity is wrapped up what people think of you you feel like you have to embrace it and lean into it rather than just letting it take up the space that it deserves which realistically isn't that much and this falls back into using not using person first language I think so often people with disabilities any anyone from any minority will identify so strongly with that part of themselves in order to reclaim ownership of it. And if you choose to do that, it's 100% fine. I have so much respect for that. But if you're choosing to do it because you feel like that's the only way to reclaim your identity, then that's a result of a much bigger problem. And if we can use our platforms that sport affords us to change that so that kids with disabilities are growing up in a world where they don't have to justify the space that they take up, where they don't have to make it to a Paralympic stage to learn they actually do value their body and themselves, that's huge. And that's what I definitely want to see change. Woo. Jeez. Hey, can Louise. we get that clip that one up for socials? I was going to say <laughs> clip it. Unbelievable. 30 se- 37 minutes. It is in. Yeah. Clip that one up. That's, <laughs> uh, that's going viral. That was amazing. Uh, hey, that was amazing. well said, Madison. Well said. Yeah, surely. Um, as you guys head over for your next games, uh, I, I'm, I hope I'm okay in asking you this, Matt, but, uh, you know, you had, uh, silver, you've had bronze, oh, but you are going. yet to hit going there. the gold going. mark. Oh, now, he's going I don't there. think it's right to set standards on colored medals, but do you set that standard for yourself? Look, <laughs> there are definitely very big goals going into these games. I think, you know, it, it's frustrating. I've managed to, do it at world championships either side of rio i haven't i went into to rio as as world champion 800 um and was not able to get the job done in rio and that definitely hurts a little bit that race that i was in that 800 um it was won in a world record time admittedly and i was second it still hurts <laughs> to think mm-hmm. about um so i think about that a lot and i think there's <clears throat> definitely a lot of added pressure i feel like i have uh the margin for error that I'm allowing myself is definitely smaller these games than it has been any other time. That was a really vague answer. I'm yeah, sorry. I was going to say, oh, yeah. very Switzerland, but I like it. Well, <laughs> my other question leading off that is, um, I watched an interview where you uh, said that, you know, basically you need to get on podiums to pay your rent in Sydney. Um, mm. Is that really the way it is? Or is that just a bit of a clickbait? Or is it really, you know, results driven means more money in your pocket and, and better food. Definitely does. And like Dylan, you were saying earlier, I think we're lucky we have other stuff going on. The marathon circuit is a professional circuit, which I'm also on. So I have a few more opportunities than others. Um, that hasn't always been the case. I obviously haven't always raced marathons and that's really the only professional avenue that there is in wheelchair racing. And I think, not every sport even has that. Water racing has it, tennis has it, basketball has a pro league in, in Italy, but that, that isn't the case for, for everyone. And if you're shorter distances, if you're just racing on the track, that isn't there. So yes, like financial security hinges on results and it all comes down to what you can do in that week. And injury, mental state, anything does not come into consideration. It's all, it's all results based, which definitely adds a layer of pressure, but yeah, your financial security is definitely tied into results. So if you come between one and four in the world, Gus, you get a certain amount of funding off the government, five to eight in the world, you get another block. 
nine to 12, you get another block. If you're outside of that, you get nothing. Oh. So it's like actually no proper results driven. So your whole program, like just say the wheelchair basketball team becomes fourth or fifth, that's the difference between hundreds of thousands of dollars. Because think about it, the government's got to fund all the sports and they want to support, fund the sports that are doing well. It's how it works. It's crazy, isn't it? When you think, no one would know that. I so, remember being in no. Rio and my 800 was the last event on the program and we'd won a medal in the relay, but the relay funding is lower. And my 800 was last and I had not medaled in an individual event. I just moved to Sydney the year before. And I remember being at the track after heat was in the morning, final was in the evening. We spent all day there because the transport was so unreliable, we couldn't get back. So I had like five hours, just me and my thoughts for the final. And I remember thinking like so much hinges on this race. If I don't make it onto the podium, I'm actually in very serious trouble. Yeah. So a lot rests on it. It's crazy. And I read, I read. No idea. This, this might not be, you might know this, Mads, but I read Olympians get 20 grand a medal. Did you read that? I also read that too. I was like, what? We don't get, we don't get anything. I know. I, I, I mean, if someone's listening to this, we'll take 20 grand a medal, please. Yeah. ScoMo. You hear that? I didn't, I didn't realise that either. Yeah, I read it. Maybe it's not true. Maybe mm, it was well, something. If you're in the Philippines and you win gold medal, you get a house and $400,000. Yeah, I know. Singapore, you get a million bucks. I sure. think about this a yeah. lot because my dad is Singaporean. What are you doing here? Get over here. Get over. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's very good. Um, I have a question for you both that's come through. It's not our bowl of uncomfortable question. We'll get to that. Um, this is a question that came through from a lady named Ash Clues. Uh, and it's a question about the Paralympics and how she wants to best represent it as a teacher. Here we go. Um, hi, Mads. Hi, Dylan. I run a childcare center. With, and with the Olympics and Paralympics coming up, we're very excited to celebrate. But I have a question for you guys. We'd love to advocate for inclusion and teach children about disabilities and what the Paralympics are. Do you have any suggestions on how to do this appropriately? Children are one to five years old. We want to be fair and inclusive, but also want them to be easy to understand. For example, the Olympics will run different events for the children to engage in, like long jump, shot put, gymnastics, etc. For teaching about Paralympics, could we still get, could we get the children to sit on their chairs and say, do volleyball or close their eyes and try and do golf, for example, or is this inappropriate? Would love to hear your thoughts. No, that's the best. You want to integrate it in as many ways as possible, starting as young as possible. And I think that disability in prompt sport is just the entry level requirement, right? Like some of our, our vision impaired guys competing in the most vision impaired class, you do have to, compete with the blindfold on because it is like you may not necessarily be at that point but that's what the class demands of you so no it's not inappropriate at all it's what is a requirement for the sport and if we're talking equipment for example like we need to move away from the idea that thinking a racing chair is a piece of mobility equipment not a piece of sporting equipment so there is nothing weird or, or inappropriate or anything about anyone with a disability jumped in the race chair in a sports chair in, in participating in any kind of Paralympic sport I would I love it I encourage it so much I think one of the best things that we get to see is when we have kids with disabilities trying out wheelchair racing for the first time and their their siblings their friends are getting involved as well that's that's what you want and we can't integrate sport the other way around we can't have kids with disabilities competing equally an able-bodied sport it's not it's a physical possibility we can do it the other way around and we need to kind of i guess remove this idea that that's a bad or inappropriate thing that disability is some taboo that has to say weird and protected over here we want that access for every single person and the playing field can't exist at able-bodied it has to exist elsewhere so we need to create that so yes my answer to that is get everyone involved whatever it's going to take Yep, and if there's other teachers listening and saying, kids keep asking me my class about disability, don't shy away from talking about it or yell at them for talking about it because it's important that we do talk about it and they are kids and then because we normalise it. Also very impressive that that teacher said she's going to ask her grade ones to do blind golf. How, how are we doing blind golf? That's going to be pretty hard. I've got questions. It's got to be one of the hardest of all. The, I don't even know if that exists. <laughs> that, that's got to be tough. That's got to be tough. Oh that would be a very tough sport. sport. Oh my God. I like yeah. that. Gosh. Um, I've got a couple more questions before we get yeah. to the ball of uncomfortable. Firstly, I've been watching a lot of your racing and will continue to, of course, at Tokyo. But uh, how is how is your back posture? Because you lean forward for the whole time. And I imagine during training, it's hours of 
What's going on with your back? What's happening here? It is so uncomfortable. So <laughs> it's the worst. My back goes before anything else in a marathon. My back goes before I'm sore anywhere else. It's definitely not the most comfortable position. But you do train it. You work it. You kind of increase that tolerance as you go. When I first jumped in a race chair when I was 11 or 12, I could last maybe five, 10 minutes in it. Like it's definitely an uncomfortable position that you you really do have to train. Yes. And, and a race, for anyone who doesn't know, a race chair... Can you describe your chair for us, just in case they haven't seen it? Got, the race chair itself is, is three wheels. You've got the two back wheels that are bigger. They're cambered out. They're on quite a significant angle. It's a long frame with a third smaller wheel up front. Um, the actual position um, that I'm in is a kneeling position. So your feet are kind of tucked up under you. Like you're very much tucked into the frame, leaning all the way forward. And what's the damage on one of them? It varies, man. They go from like... $5,000 for the frame all the way up to nearly $30,000 for a frame. Yeah. That's why you got That's why you got Carbon fiber going on there. That's why you got to yeah. win races to pay the bills, Gus. That's why you got to win the races. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I just want to know what your, we've spoken to Dylan before uh, this episode, but we, I'd, I'd love to know what your preparation is looking like. So Dylan's hanging out in saunas because he's trying to get more acclimatized, you know, potentially going to Darwin. Um, what are you doing for this as you head over to 30 plus degree weather over in Tokyo? We're doing a lot of heat training um, and we actually have for quite a while. So our last few major comps have been Doha, Dubai, Rio. We've been preparing to compete in the heat for quite a while now. Um, so at the moment, I'll be doing two sessions in the heat chamber, um, the climate chamber. So sometimes at altitude, not for Tokyo, we haven't been, but previously it's heat and, and altitude plus a bunch of like passive heat sessions. So you will complete your actual session outside on the road and then you'll jump in the heat straight away to kind of keep your body elevated for a longer period of time so a lot of heat work yes that's a great answer to show people might think the paralympics is a bit kumbaya we all sit around hold hands and sing songs because we're happy to be there your heat chambering altitude training you know it's the same like what goes in to be the best in the world is the same whether you're disabled or not mm -hmm. uh, or an, so i love hearing that um, i've got three quick questions three semi rapid fire but you can go into them if you want one, what's your marathon PB? 139 something. <laughs> One hour 39. Gus, what's yours? Uh, it took me four, nearly five hours to run that 27 K. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I didn't a, even make it. I did a half marathon in 137. So you do a full marathon at the time I do a half. That is <laughs> shocking by me. I love it. Um, secondly, the Maddie, uh, Madison Di Rosario Barbie doll. Tell me how that came about and mm. what did that mean to you to see an actual, like what is the number one toy in the world after you? I, I shared it on my social. I thought it was one of the coolest things I've ever seen. She lives on my bookshelf um, and it has not gotten less weird to, to see it every day. Um, that is to this day the, the highest compliment I have ever been paid. Um, <laughs> I think to have a brand like Barbie pick a woman with disability to represent sport in Australia is significant just on its own that's huge um having been I, I, knowing the women in sport in, in australia and knowing the options that were available that is what makes it such a, an enormous compliment that i cannot wrap my head around um but i i think one of the huge parts that came of it was just i think alignment of values i think barbie as a brand has had such a history Troubled and, past? Can we say troubled past? Can we say troubled yeah. past? Okay, thank you. Um, and I think the direction they're going in with really authentic diversity is huge. And not just in, in the toys they're producing being, you know, every, every girl is able to see themselves in a doll. That's enormous. Every girl with a disability friend are able to see their friend as a doll. That's also enormous. On top of that, outside of just product, Barbie has so many um, structures in place to show girls they can do and be anything and everything they want to be. And that's what the Shiro campaign is a part of. Another is um, basically like, I don't know the best way to describe it, so I might not do this justice. An enormous like job festival pitched at children. So it's in LA, got cancelled um, last year because of COVID. But basically the idea was to, bring in as many incredible, powerful women from every 
possible career path. So from the sciences to the sport, to the arts, to, to everything, I think Alex Morgan was one of the ones that was meant to come in for it. For girls at no cost, the girls or their families to come in and see that firsthand and be exposed to the potential that is there because we lose sight of what we're able to do so young. Like one of the studies conducted basically had boys and girls under I think the age of five being told to draw a scientist. So all the girls drew girl scientists and the boys drew boy scientists. They drew themselves as a scientist. And after I think the age of five, everyone in that room, every child drew a boy scientist. At some point, super young at around five, that's now a boy job. And so even though we might change our mind and that as we get older, it's still years of conditioning to believe that our potential is capped. So I think getting to align with a brand that is actively trying to change that from such a young age at the root of the problem, that was a huge privilege. Very well said. Love well, that. Plus, plus, plus. I also have to say, I watched that interview. That was, I don't know how you spoke to a Barbie doll for that four and a half minutes in that apartment, but uh, <laughs> congratulations to you for sticking through it. That's the hardest thing I've ever felt in my life. <laughs> That's, that's very good. Literally talking to a Barbie doll on her kitchen bench. Doll. <laughs> make a smoothie. Oh, that's so funny. Okay. Um, last one for me before yep. the bowl of uncomfortable. You get some absolutely whack, weird trolls on your social media. Some of the weirdest stuff. When did that start and how do you handle it? Because you know, it's tough for any athlete, but especially with a disability like yourself, like some of the shit that you get, sorry, some of the stuff that you get said is pretty tough. Yeah, look, um, it's not great out there. Um, it was definitely, it's gotten less confronting as time's gone by. And I think one thing that we kind of demand of women who I think are the brunt of these kinds of comments is to be um, the bigger person, to not comment on it. And basically you end up being complicit in your own dehumanization. You're allowing it to happen um, and creating a space for it to continue happening because there's just no consequences. Obviously there's so much anonymity online and I think we've all received the most uncomfortable comments, messages, all of it. But one of the things that we do is we, we tell women to just not react to it. And so we create this space that just allows it. And then you as a woman are the one that has to kind of deal with that discomfort. And that rests entirely on you despite not being a part of that particular problem. So at first, that is exactly what I was doing. And you kind of think, oh, this is just what comes with having a platform. I have to read these messages or I can choose to completely ignore it. And that's the other thing that you're told a lot is just don't read those message requests. But I think we all know the beautiful messages that come through those message requests and how many, you know, how much of an impact you can have. Like how many parents have we had message us saying, you know, my child saw you do this, would love, you know, whatever. And you can interact with that person and actually create really significant, you know, change in that person's life, which makes it worth reading. The awful ones doesn't make them easier to, to handle. So ignoring them, that isn't the solution here. What I found was I started to just post them purely for my own validation. It wasn't actually trying to make good change. I think it just got to a point where I couldn't handle it on my own. Um, and the amount of women and really young girls who would message me with their versions of this and I think it kind of created almost this um, community that I got to be a part of, of kind of sharing that experience, which alleviates how that feels so much. And I think the messages that you would get from other young women saying, I saw you dealing with this like this, it made me do this, it was really empowering. That's huge and significant. And I think young girls being able to just like take control of their own narrative and story and the way they're treated and not just accept this kind of treatment is huge and I just like that it took me to my 20s to decide I didn't deserve to be treated like this if I could you know if it didn't take that long if, if something that I have done or said or posted has made a 13 year old realize that they don't have to deal with this at that age and demand the respect they deserve that's huge so that I mean doesn't make it worth it because the messages are really awful um but yeah you, at least it's doing some good I just want to add if you are one of those uh -huh. people who are a troll, uh, don't be a flog. And it's not <laughs> funny. And it affects people as well, like and it does. And like, you might be having a great day and then I read something about myself and you're like, it just, 
why they, I don't care anymore, but why people go out of their way to do that, it affects people uh, in a bad way. So stop it. Stop sending Mads vlog messages, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> it is time, Madison Di Rosario, to get into the bowl of uncomfortable. This is where somebody sends us a message, a question that they wouldn't feel comfortable to say to you in person, but they can do it anonymously through our socials. Well, I should research it's a question. podcast. We're going to be on it. All right, go on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> This is for both of you. What? Hang on. I didn't sign up for bowls for myself. Well, I mean, you can both answer. I am disabled and I hate the Paralympics. It says this, it sets this, it sets a standard 99% of people with disability will never or don't want to reach. I'm in a senior position at my accounting firm. I've worked my heart out to get here yet. I still get asked if I play sport or if I ever wanted to make the Paralympics. Do you feel part of the responsibility for the problem we face daily because you play sport? I do not feel part of the problem, no, but I do recognise where this person is coming from. I think that our idea of disability has changed, kind of what I said earlier, where we want to put an umbrella thing over all disability. And it used to be, um, and it's changed that we decide is disability. It's kind of come from not being able to, to participate in, in society or, or employment or be valued members of community. And it's taken this massive jump to elite sport and it's missed everything in the middle. And the reality is obviously disability exists on a spectrum. What we're now doing with disability is demanding excellence in order to be accepted. And sport does play a role in that because what we see of disability, like I think we both are fully aware, is mostly sport. It's our athletes that we do see with the brightest spotlight being shone on them. And I do agree that's a problem. I want kids with disabilities to see Paralympic sport and not think oh I can be an athlete it's this is a bunch of people doing anything and everything they want to do they're completely reclaiming their identity and doing anything that they choose to do and that's going to look so different for every single person and I think we need to embrace that a lot more than we do and I agree we definitely have changed our idea of disability it's evolving in a really positive direction but it's probably missed quite a few really important steps. 100%. Hundred percent, and that that person has every right to be a bit paid off about it. Imagine not playing sport and someone from work coming and go, "I'm oh, so have you tried any Paralympics or you tried sports?" Like I don't like sport. Like you know what I mean? And I think one of the and you nailed it. And I can't really add anything because that was perfect. But the, like you're on TV because of sport with a disability or the inspirational porn sob story raising money for your wheelchair i'm sick in hospital that's the only thing times you used to get on tv with a disability or probably still and that sucks right we need more artists musicians accountants lawyers tv presenters mums school teachers politicians with disability in the mainstream so then it's not just people with sport and that is my hope your hope you know, that's all we want because I couldn't agree more. That would be punishing if everybody says, oh, you're in a wheelchair. Do you know Dylan Alcott or do you know Madison D. Rosario? Just because you're in a wheelchair. It's like, why would I know that person? You know what I mean? And so I fu- I fully appreciate that. And and that's something that I sometimes do feel bad about. And um, I want there to be hundreds of thousands of names of people with disability that people know, not just the, a select few. And people, you know, people write tweets to us saying, oh, you flogs always get in the limelight, like like we want that. You know, we don't want that. We want to share that. We want more people with disability to get out there because, you know, not everyone has the opportunity to be a Paralympian or play sport, but they have an opportunity to their own career, but they aren't getting those opportunities in their own career because they're not provided. So it's up to all of us to keep smashing that glass ceiling so people can get out there. But I'll take on that hate because that's fair enough. You know what I mean? But we're not trying to do that. Um, but and I promise you we're not. And they have every right to head the Paralympics, but hopefully they watch in Tokyo and we change <laughs> and we change their mind. Mm-hmm. What do you reckon? Hey, give us a chance. We're nice, <laughs> I promise. Uh, Madison, good luck across all of your events. Uh, we'll be watching and we'll be sharing it on our socials, your journey. And speaking of socials, Madison dot, how many underscores? Is it three underscores? Yeah, well, how many? Oh, and I can't change it because it's a verified account. So oh. won't let me change it. So it's whatever, it's a matter. Hey, that- that Madison is the ultimate dot, first. Underscore, 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 oh, yeah. underscore. <laughs> Listener.